Uh, welcome everyone to our monthly webinar series. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Las penas con el pan duelen menos, um, or I'm having a trouble translating right now, but eating disorders in Latinx communities. I'll let Melissa explain uh, the translation of that in a presentation. So Melissa Carmona comes uh, to us today um, and I will be introducing her more formally in a little bit. Um, so as you may or may not know, our webinars try to be as interactive as possible. Um, what helps with that is if you can turn your video on, um, it really helps us to see you and interact and see reactions as we're presenting. Um, and then we also encourage folks uh, to either type in the chat, I'll be monitoring chat if you have questions as they happen throughout the presentation. Um, and then also there'll be uh, designated times where we might stop and allow people to unmute and ask questions and um, hopefully have a great conversation on this really important topic that Melissa is presenting on today. Uh, we wanna say a big thank you to Greensboro AHEC who are our partners in uh, providing continuing education credits. So hopefully you uh, would have already registered prior to coming here with them and you will be able to get your credits uh, by completing the post webinar survey uh, that you will get after today's session. Um, wanted to float this by you all. So we had um, scheduled this prolonged exposure training, which is an evidence-based therapy for treatment of um, PTSD uh, with its originer, originator, Edna Foa. Um, we had, uh, I think it was set up for March of this year or April of this year. And then, as you know, that was a uh, time that COVID broke out. So we have now moved it to a virtual session that will be taking place um, April 9th through the 11th. Um, we know it's full days on Zoom, um, but uh, Dr. Foa has assured us that she's done this virtually before plenty of breaks and it's really great to um, have this training um, straight from the person that created it. Um, we will reopen our registration in January. Um, so um, stay um, tuned on our network and uh, we have been able to expand attendance, I think from 35 to 50. So there's quite a few slots still left open. So just keep an eye out for that. Uh, and a big thank you for the Duke University Health System who have whose funding has made it possible for us to host uh, Dr. Edna Foa. I think the price is 175, which compared to the 1600 that folks typically have to pay for this kind of training is um, pretty good. So um, just look out for that. So I wanna introduce our speaker today, um, Melissa Carmona. She is a bilingual clinical mental health counselor at Three Birds Counseling in Greensboro, North Carolina. She works um, from a trauma-informed social justice, uh, health at every size and intuitive eating perspective. And she'll be presenting uh, on a lot of that today. Um, she attended the University of North Carolina at Greensboro where she graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and a Master of Science in Clinical and Mental Health. That's where I first met Melissa. We were working in Dr. Gabriela Stein's uh, lab. She is an undergrad, me as a graduate student. Uh, we've driven out to Asheboro and other uh, towns in North Carolina to conduct tons of family interviews for the research that Dr. Stein did. So it's just so cool to link back up again in, in this manner. Feels like yesterday. I know. And like a million years ago at the same time <laughs> because of COVID. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, so currently, um, Melissa is an EMDR trained therapist. Uh, she's worked with people of all ages and families uh, in both private and community settings. And we're just so honored to have her here with us. Um, so Melissa, I will now unshare and have you share. And we'll start off with some polls to give us an idea of who's in the room with us today. Thank you. And just want to make sure you clicked that button. It should have been clicked from before. <laughs> you can just unshare. Totally right. Share. Totally right. Thank you so much for the reminder. Um, no worries. I always forget I it. about it. I joke a lot about technology stuff because you would think that after having to switch all online. Um, hold on. My brain can't think and speak at the same time. That I've gotten really good at Zoom 
It's not the case. It is not the case. All right. So if you can go to the next slide, Melissa, um, that'll give folks a guide about where you fall in this poll. You could please click on whatever applies to you. Yeah, and that looks great right there, Melissa. So we can go ahead and publish the results. So we have a fair amount of triangle, some triad, um, southwestern and western, but we really we're hitting every spot, which is really cool. And we can go to the next one. So I want to know um, what best describes your position and if this list doesn't cover um, what you would consider yourself to be, please uh, click other and uh, specify in the chat for us. I think we can publish. So pretty heavy on social workers. We have some psychologists, um, some counselors, and then we've got a few people. We got a registered dietitian, LMFT, second year PhD candidate at um, ECU for clinical psychology. So the usual random bunch of professionals, not random, sorry, uh, <laughs> varied. Um, bunch of professionals that we'd love to have on these webinars. So I will turn it back over to you fully, Melissa, and you can take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so many things going on in my in front of me, so I'm trying to organize everything really quick, but I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, eating disorders in the Latinx community is something that I'm very, very passionate about. And so I'm hoping that you all will get to hear a little bit of that. Uh, and now that I think about it, I have a cockatiel in the room. So at some point you may hear him. <laughs> I didn't think about taking him out. So at some point, hopefully he won't make an introduction. His name is Pepe. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, there were so many different things that I wanted to talk about today. There were so, so many different routes that you can go when it comes to eating disorders and specifically in the Latinx community. And so I kind of want to give people a heads up. This is going to be barely scratching the surface, unfortunately. So already encouraging people to make sure you take it beyond what I might have to offer today too. Um, I'm going to be speaking from a clinical perspective, but also from a personal perspective. And, and the, all of that being said, this is only um, my experience as a counselor, my experience as a whole other human being. And so again, another reason to make sure you kind of go beyond what I may have to offer today. So again, who am I? Mi nombre es Melissa. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Once again, I'm a counselor at Three Birds Counseling and Clinical Supervision here in Greensboro, North Carolina. I am Yandira Trained, intuitive eating and health at Arisa's counselor who also works through a social justice lens. Um, it's really hard not to. And I think that's an invitation for people to kind of expand on what that may mean for you as a professional. I also do evaluations for immigration purposes, such as VAWA, U visa, and extreme hardships. I'm a Colombiana, daughter of immigrants, loved one of undocumented and deported individuals, and I hold a lot of privilege. I hold the privilege of being a US citizen, a white Latina, cisgender, and being able-bodied. And I always like to start my presentations with that because um, this work is personal. And when I say this work, I mean the work that any person in a helping position does. There are all sorts of things in your life that influence you to, in some way that led you to the career you have today. And so we have to make sure we acknowledge them because the ways that you offer services to your patients or clients is in some way influenced by what is happening, what has happened in your life. And the privilege we hold could in some way be having an effect on treatment you might be offering. And that's probably going to be a theme that you also notice during today's webinar. And so what does that mean? So that may mean that as a, um, I'm, a I'm a citizen, right? Citizenship is a privilege. I work with undocumented 
undocumented immigrants all the time? Am I offering resources that they can even access? Um, realistically speaking, right? I am able-bodied. Am I um, proposing a treatment plan that I don't even know what it looks like in my client's everyday life? I'm cisgender. Am I acknowledging that the relationship with my body might look completely different than my trans or non-binary clients? I'm a white Latina. Do I realize the, the ways in which my own body image healing may look completely different from an Afro-Latinx or Black Latinx person, especially when addressing colorism, racism, overall anti-Blackness? Um, my goal today is that you're able to learn more about eating disorders in the Latinx communities but also to take it a little bit further than what numbers may offer you. I think that a lot of times we do get caught up on the numbers behind research, definitely the number on the scale, definitely on the labels, uh, the numbers that labels may offer you. And so this is also an invitation for you to kind of take things a little bit further than that. Um, and so we'll, we'll start it with that. And this is also me. So you notice that I had this really, what I thought, felt like a cute picture of me, loving my earrings, loving my, how glowing my skin looked that day. Um, but I think it's extremely important for me to also show other pictures about myself. One, because I don't like to take myself too seriously. And two, because I believe that as professionals, sometimes we forget we have our own stuff too. Um, as professionals, we're commonly asked for pictures of ourselves, maybe for webinars like these, maybe for articles. Um, for our websites, for other events. And even we become so used to only seeing ourselves through a certain angle, a certain lighting, a position, a specific parts of our body. And so another invitation to assess in what ways do you model this for your clients as well? How does this come into, let's say for me, the counseling room, your appointments with your clients, because your body as a whole comes into the room and shares that space with your client. So it's very, very important for you to kind of acknowledge what that looks like too. Um, counter transference and transfers is a very real thing with our clients. And when it comes to eating disorders, it's definitely something that will come up. I've had clients that resented me for losing weight after I gave birth to my baby. And I've had clients that named my body the worst nightmare that they could think of. So it's very much very important for you to kind of sit with grounding yourself with where you are in your own um, journey. So all of that being said, a gentle reminder to take care of yourself during this webinar. Um, some of the content that I am gonna be talking about could be triggering for folks. So make sure that you take care of yourself in whatever way you can right now. We all have bodies, all of our bodies need to eat, which means you will be reflecting on what your own relationship with food in your body looks like. And throughout the webinar, I'm also gonna be bringing up some of these self-reflection moments through throughout and um, it's gonna be an invitation for you to kind of look within in terms of where you are, but these could also be prompts that you use within your, your sessions with your clients. These are questions that you could easily use with your clients to kind of explore where they may be when it comes to their body and their relationship with food. So kind of jumping into just a short roadmap, we're gonna start out with a very, very, very short review of what eating disorders and feeding disorders are per the DSM-5. Um, then we're going to jump into eating disorders in the Latinx community, such as prevalence, risk factors, cultural consideration, and body image ideals. Then we're going to move forward to talking up beyond food and weight talk and addressing marginalization. And then we're going to end it with culturally sensitive and inclusive treatment. So I'll talk a little bit about haze, a little bit about intuitive eating, social justice, and cultural humility. humility. So let's go ahead and jump in. So I won't be going into detail when it comes to the diagnosis themselves, because really, if you're interested in learning about the criteria for diagnosis, that's information that you can directly get from the DSM-5. Um, and there's lots and lots of information online too um, when it comes to diagnoses, but I do wanna offer a little bit more of an overview before we dive in. Um, so on the DSM-5 for feeding and eating disorders, we have anorexia nervosa, which can be restrictive and binge purging type. We have bulimia nervosa and we have binge eating disorder. Um, a really quick note, there's the assumption that there is no restriction in bulimia or binge eating disorders a lot of times. I, I would definitely argue that restriction can be a part of all of these and then therefore trigger lots of the behaviors that may follow. Um, 
We have feeding disorders such as avoidant restrictive food intake disorder or ARFID, rumination disorder, PICA or PICA. Um, and then we have other specified feeding and eating disorders and unspecified feeding and eating disorders, as well as two other ones that we are frequently talking about that are not in the DSM-5, which are orthorexia and diabulimia. It's very important for me to highlight OSFED because it's one of the most commonly diagnosed um, eating disorders for folks. And OSFED is an umbrella term for folks that don't necessarily meet full criteria for other eating disorders. Um, but it's important to really kind of sit with the fact of how dangerous that is sometimes too, because it can very much be dismissed by professionals, by the clients, by the family um, or support system as a whole when in reality they can be as dangerous and harmful as any of the other diagnoses. Um, and a quick note about orthorexia. Orthorexia means like it, it involves an obsessive behavior with healthful eating and diabulimia being where the client will purposefully restrict their insulin in order to manipulate, in an attempt to manipulate their weight. So what are eating and feeding disorders? Um, Eating and feeding disorders are a psychiatric condition characterized by irregular habits and behaviors. Um, it may or may not include body image distress, over-evaluation of body size and shape, a desire for control of weight and fear, and or, because it's not always the case, a fear of weight gain. It has a behavioral medical impact on our clients, such as cognitively and emotionally, and it can have many, many medical components and complications, which I'll kind of talk a little bit about in the next slide. It can be multifactorial. So um, genetics and a history of dieting would be an example of that. There probably, I would say the um, restriction overall, I would add to that too. Um, we also hold, well, and by the way, let me say this, that genetics and dieting and history of dieting are the two strongest predictors for eating disorders. We also have person, personality characteristics such as anxiety, perfectionism, impulsivity, low self-esteem, psychological inflexibility. So think about those people that tend to see things very rigidly. Um, and we also have social, cultural, and environmental. So things like such as um, trauma, uh, weight stigma and fat phobia, limited social support, appearances and aesthetics. Um, environments in which appearances and aesthetics are very much like um, very much a part of the culture. And eating disorders can often co-occur with other psychiatric disorders such as um, obsessive compulsive disorders, trauma, um, substance misuse, and personality concerns. And so I wanted to go over some of the health consequences because I, I do believe that um, for many reasons, we tend to kind of skip over them when in reality, there's a reason why eating disorders are so incredibly dangerous. And it goes beyond the, oh, I just wanna lose weight. Oh, I'm just like, I have low self-esteem stuff. It, it, it has an impact on our health. And so we have, uh, it, yep, it has a significant impact on emotional cognitive distress and behavioral disruption, um, such as anxiety and depression, self-injury, suicidality and trauma. There's a social isolation, I'm gonna talk so much about this, social isolation aspect of eating disorders and interpersonal distress. It has a lot of physical impacts and the, this list is just not, um, there's just not as enough space in this slide to be able to include all of them. And by the way, these, uh, these last three slides were slides that I took from uh, a presentation my good friend and I, Dr. Lindsay Amstead did on a webinar back in August, so just wanted to kind of name some of that. Um, eating disorder can have an impact on all our organs, um, our heart, uh, our intestines, our, our, our kidneys. Neurologically, it causes brain shrinkage, difficulty sleeping, fainting, dizziness. Um, it, can it has an impact on our metabolism, lowered sex hormones, can lead to osteoporosis. I will never forget the day that I was consulting with one of my client's doctors. She is 11 years old. And the doctor was telling me that she had the bone density of a 70 year, 70 year old. Um, it's still hard for my brain to kind of figure out what does that mean? But it's one of the biggest examples that I think about. Uh, when I have clients coming in that have a history of bulimia, I'm always, always worried about their heart because they're at such high risk of potentially having a heart attack. Um, 
reproductive systems, um, they, they can lose their periods um, and therefore have and also have an impact in terms of um, causing infertility for many too. There's hair loss, there's dry skin, there's hair growth in other parts of our body because our body is trying to figure out how to keep the body warm um, because of feeling cold all the time. There's anemia, dental problems, um, and low white blood cell count due to malnutrition and become immunocompromised, which is one of the biggest reasons why when COVID started, we had to just completely switch everything online because our clients would be considered high risk. Um, uh, they're life-threatening and can be fatal. Anorexia nervosa being one of the highest mortality rates following opiate addiction. Um, so there's that. Uh, I wanted to kind of share a, a couple of the myths that I frequently hear when it comes to eating disorders, which include eating disorders only affect young, white, thin, cis women. That's not true. Everybody can struggle with an eating disorder. Marginalized communities are frequently left out of research. Um, so think about the erasure even in that. Marginalized communities experience more stigma around eating disorders and mental illness altogether. Marginalized communities are less likely to be diagnosed with an eating disorder and have access to care. Um, and I'm looking at the chat, by the way, too. Thank you so much. I, I, I love being able to read what people are, are saying. Age 11 is so young. Will you be talking about how an 11 year old can develop an eating disorder? Um, I think I will throughout the presentation because we'll be ta talking about like beauty image ideals and how those are built over time too. And, um, and I think that that in and of itself can be a specific thing, but I do wanna address that. Like, I think that stereotypically, we, well, when I have these types of conversations with people, a lot of people think that the younger folks are the ones that are only developing eating disorders, but I would say it's across all ages. Um, Another Melissa, myth. Yeah. Sorry, I'll I'll just mention I'll monitor the chat for you just so right. we because that we can get derailed into just answering a, a number of questions. I think if you find natural pausing points, we can pause and maybe address some of the questions that are piling up. But I'm encouraging people to type them in and then oh, we'll okay. address them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um you can tell another myth is you can tell who's struggling with which eating disorder. That's a big myth. That's a big myth. Fat people can struggle with anorexia nervosa. That's one of the biggest things that I hear. The assumption that fat people, and by the way, I use the word fat as a neutral descriptor. Um, some people feel very comfortable using the word fat, some don't, and I'm mindful of where people may be with that. But no, nope, uh, fat people can struggle with anorexia nervosa too. Then people can struggle with binge eating disorder and elders also struggle with eating disorders and so on. Eating disorders are only about vanity. No, body image concerns can be part of some eating disorders, not all of them. Body image concerns tend to be at the surface level, I would say, of eating disorders. Um, and usually there's more at the core. There's no, there's always more at the core, to be very honest, right? Because um, there's always these core beliefs of I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy. Body image is the one thing that we feel ha we have control over, which is such an illusion in so many ways. Binge eating disorder is an addiction to food. Uh, that's another myth. Nope. Uh, research continues to show that once semi-starvation, and I say semi-starvation as um, it, like restriction of any kind, and that includes dieting. Um, once the research continues to show that once that restriction stops, so can eating disorder behaviors such as binge eating. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's like a very big. Um, it's a big deal and it's something that we address a lot in, in therapy. Eating disorders are a choice. That's a big, that's a big myth. Uh, eating disorders are also an illness. Eating disorders are not just a matter of just stop eating or just eat more. Food restriction can be safe after recovery. I get this question very often. Unfortunately, there's no safe way for diet or restriction to happen without it potentially triggering and therefore causing a relapse. If you want to learn more about the basis of eating disorders, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email will be at the end of this. Again, my friend and I created a webinar uh, and we have the recording. There's a small sliding scale fee for it, but it's free for BIPOC folks. So um, if that's something that you're interested in learning more, feel free to reach out to me. So now let's go ahead and jump into eating disorders and in the Latinx community, prevalence, risk factors, cultural considerations and body image ideals. 
So spoiler alert, yes, uh, Latinx communities struggle with eating disorders too. Like many other mental illnesses, uh, there's just great stigma behind it. And um, therefore we just, we don't talk about it. I would like to add that in addition to stigma, fat phobia has been normalized across our cultures in many ways. And I know that the word fat phobia um, makes a lot of folks very uncomfortable these days, but we can't talk about eating disorders without addressing fat phobia. We cannot talk about eating disorders and recovery without addressing fat phobia and the ways in which we internalize those messages too, as providers ourselves and our clients too. So what does the research say? So again, another spoiler alert and probably unsurprising to many of you, research about eating disorders in the Latinx community is very limited. Um, but here's what I found. I found that in the early 2000s, so this was like 20 years ago, uh, 20 plus years ago. Now at this point, I would say it was before then. Um, in the early 2000s, ethnicity was considered a protective factor for women um, from different ethnic backgrounds who weighed more than white women and whose culture actually idealized a larger curvier body type. Since then though, um, it has been found that non-white folks compare themselves to body ideals present in the dominant culture. So think about the United States um, and end up engaging in restrictive, restrictive behaviors to achieve thinner bodies. And something you'll hear me say the word restriction, by the way, and by restriction, I mean any type of like way that you may take away a food group, um, control the amount of that specific food group, like restriction can mean a lot more than in what we think about when we think about eating disorders, by the way. Um, let's see, binge eating disorder is the most common eating disorder among Hispanic Latinos. Um, there are comparable rates of bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder among Hispanic Latinos and non-Hispanic whites. Prevalence rates of anorexia nervosa are lower um, among Hispanic Latinos compared to non-Hispanic whites. OSFID is, is commonly diagnosed in um, Latinx communities and um, Latinx men also struggle with eating disorders. It's just that it couldn't find any like accurate numbers when it comes to that. Again, the research on eating disorders in the Latinx community is very, very limited. Um, and a couple of the studies have found that the eating disorder symptoms, such as like unhealthy weight control behaviors, such as dieting or compensatory behavior, such as purging or over-exercising, or even taking medicine for weight loss, were actually higher in the Latinx population compared to any of the other groups. And yet they're the ones that are most diagnosed or most likely diagnosed with OSFED, right? The one that I talked about earlier that's usually dismissed because it doesn't meet full criteria for it. And so I'm curious that this is a part where I kind of want to bring it into folks. I'm curious to know as to why people think that even though binge eating this, like as to why people think that binge eating disorder and OSFID are commonly diagnosed in this population within Latinx folks. Um, I'm curious to know what people think about that. Why, even though some research shows that we also engage in restriction just like any other cultures, why is it that we're commonly diagnosed with binge eating disorder in OSFED? And you are asking this to mm -hmm. folks openly. So folks can either type in the chat or unmute. And I'll just pose a couple of related questions that came uh, since we're talking about prevalence rates. Uh, several folks asked about like, how young is too young to diagnose an eating disorder? Or, you know, how, how young can these issues show up? And when should we be intervening uh, and considering it, you know, a, a full fledged eating disorder? I would say it's getting younger and younger, unfortunately, sadly. The youngest client I've had is nine years old uh, with an eating disorder, anorexia nervosa. And so um, I don't know if I have a concrete answer. According to DSM-5, there's no age limit for it. Um, but I do, I can say it's getting younger and younger. Um, there are very much ways that you can assess for it. I didn't include any of the assessments on this webinar, but if you have any questions about them, I can email them to you. Um, but there are ways that you can assess for it included in your intake paperwork, right? A simple question such as like, uh, what is the relationship with your body and with food look like, right? And then it kind of goes from there. A lot of times with adults, I get some sort of joke. And when I get a joke, 
I'm curious to know why. Like I always get the whole like trying to be funny thing of like, oh, I have no problem with that. Uh, um, or they'll say something like, I feel like I have the opposite way kind of problem. So I'll be like, well, kind of expand on that. I want to I want to know a little bit more about it. Um, I'm so oh. some comments have come in. Uh, some people were wondering if you could uh, define again, OSFED and uh, bigger X, yeah. Mm -hmm. So OSFED is other specified feeding and eating disorder. And so it's an umbrella term for those people that have, are struggling with eating disorder type behaviors, such as maybe restriction, such as maybe over exercising, maybe purging behaviors, maybe binge eating behaviors, but don't necessarily meet the full criteria. And so with the DSM, I forget like what, what the timeline looks like, but it has to be like certain amount of days uh, for certain like however many times. And so these are people that don't necessarily meet criteria. Unfortunately, weight is one of those things that falls into that. So for example, folks could be very much struggling with anorexia nervosa and because of their weight, because they're not considered underweight, um, they won't be diagnosed with anorexia, which is incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. Um, and so OSFID would be kind of like that umbrella term. And vigorexia, I think, was the other one. And then vigorexia, uh, I think vigorexia is a word in Spanish because I read this paper in Spanish. Um, it was talking about how men have these beauty ideals of having to be muscular. Um, and so there's more of that emphasis of what the male, which I'll talk a little bit more about, how the male body is supposed to look like. And I hope everybody sees my like quotations. <laughs> um, really this expectation of what male bodies are supposed to look like. Um, in terms of your question, Melissa, the, um, so some folks are saying there may be some bias uh, from the PCPs doing the diagnosing. Mm -hmm. um, our psychiatrist, Cecilia Ardones, says food restriction, use of pills, laxatives might be culturally accepted and practiced versus uh, binge eating disorder. Absolutely. I mean, that's my theory. I, I, this is a very genuine question um, for me because it's one of those things that I'm curious to know what people's perspective of this. And possibly many of you have probably have an experience like this with your own counselor, or with your own doctor. Um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is absolutely that, the fact that the DSM-5 and other medical models in the United States always don't always address cultural factors um, that are important to consider when addressing topics like these. And it, and it, like, and it always raises a question, again, do these models really capture do, does the DSM-5 really capture what eating disorders look like for the Latinx community? And very frequently, I will say this about binge eating disorder, unfortunately, very frequently come people come into their doctor's appointments and they say that they're eating too much. That's the thing that they, they bring up, that they're eating too much. And instead, the, I say doctors because this is the example that um, I hear many times from my clients, um, but this could be across the board when it comes to professional instead of trying to dig in a little bit deeper as to what's going on, uh, what is it that they mean when they say they're eating too much, we start prescribing diets, we start um, recommending medications to suppress appetite, we recommend downloading apps to track our food, instead of digging deeper as to what's going on. So without even realizing that the client or the patient has been engaging in all types of dangerous behaviors that could impact their health. And I think this is the part where absolutely, you're totally right, Unfortunately, there's a lot of bias, um, and specifically when we talk about um, fat phobia as a whole. So I had plenty of conversations with medical providers, unfortunately, where there was this belief that if my client was fat, there's no way they're restricting. Um, and that's very hard to sit with. So let me kind of... I think yeah, just uh, you can keep going after this, but I just wanted to bring a few points from folks. Um, folks are saying that there's maybe some focus on the BMI or the numbers of it without mm -hmm. focusing maybe as much on the dysfunction that's being caused by uh, the restrictions. Um, and there's also bias about people being fat or overweight, restricting that being seen as a good thing. Um, and then really just bias, like you're saying, I think fat phobia that um, overweight uh, folks' problems are dismissed more readily than others. 100%, 100%, right? I hear stories over and over and over again 
of the time they went into the doctor's office because they had a cold and they were recommended weight loss. Of the time when they had uh, an injury to a knee and they were recommended to lose weight. Consulted once again, they had broken their knee or something like that. Like they had other problems that would have been addressed very differently if the client came in and was then. And so that's something that I want people to sit with. And I can only imagine, unfortunately, those are the kind of stories that I hear the most too. So I can only imagine many of you have had experiences like this, where you come into the doctor's office um, or somewhere else, and the focus is on the numbers, right? So these messages that are reinforced in so many different ways from a very young age of hyper-focusing on the number, on something external, something outside of our body, that's not able to give us any other information. And so that's something that I want folks to kind of sit with too. Um, I'm gonna jump into cultural values in the Latinx community because I think this is very important when it comes to recovery and um, helping Latinx folks. Um, only a couple of them, but these are my favorite to talk about. <laughs> and I think that they all have, um, they're all important to talk about. So we have collectivism, which speaks to us uh, being high, a highly group oriented. And uh, it's the strong emphasis is placed on the collective as the major source of one's identity and protection against the hardships of life. And by collective, collective makes me think about communities, families, friends, countries, that togetherness that comes with that. Familismo promotes um, family loyalty, cohesiveness, and obedience. It, it can sometimes dictate norms, expectations, and beliefs about, what the, about the family. And, um, and it's important to know that as providers initially, we're not part of that collective. And therefore we have, uh, it will take some time and patience to build rapport and trust um, with the client or with the family. You can see these in many ways. Um, well, I'll jump into some examples after I go over all of them. But sonalismo speaks to a more intimate interactions between the provider and the client as means of building trust and rapport. We have respeto, respeto or respect means that each person is expected to defer to those who are in a position of authority because of age, gender, social position, title or economic status. And, um, and just so you know, healthcare providers such as us, doctors and doctors especially I would say are viewed as authority figures. So sometimes what we'll see is Latino patients or parents that will tend to demonstrate um, respect in these settings and be hesitant to ask questions or raise concerns about the doctor's recommendations and being fearful that you, they might be um, being disrespectful. We have machismo and marianismo. Machismo describes beliefs and expectations regarding the role of men in society. It's a set of values, attitudes, and belief about masculinity or what, um, it's, what it means to be a man. Machismo also encompasses masculinity, including like aspects of masculinity, such as bravery, honor, dominance, aggression, sexism, um, and reserved emotions. Marianismo is a construction of expected female gender roles based on the Virgin Mary. And Marianismo emphasizes the role of women as family and home-centered, um, but also encourages passivity and self-sacrifice and purity. Um, I, it's some of the examples, and I wanna encourage people like even in the chat box to kind of name some of the examples that come to mind when thinking about these cultural values in, in relation to therapy in general, in relation to eating disorders. But a couple of examples that come to mind is that diet culture and eating disorders isolate you. In a culture where we thrive through connection, isolating ourselves from them, from like the collective, can put us at a higher risk of struggling with overall mental health and absolutely have an impact on our recovery from an eating disorder, right? Because if one of the highlights of an eating disorder is disconnect, is isolation, imagine the impact when a person that, that thrives in the collective is struggling with this. Um, you will see families, another example is that maybe you'll see families coming into appointments together. So this would be an example of uh, familismo, maybe even personalismo making healthcare decisions together, if there's a need to be, if there needs to be a referral to a dietitian or to go to a higher level of care, the family would probably want to make the decision together and maybe consulting with extended family and trying to see what they think. With personalismo, you may, may uh, the client may want to ask for your personal opinion on what they should do, not necessarily professional, but then there's that other side of respecting the position of power that you hold to and what your recommendations may be. Um, 
and thinking about disconnect again, um, like the more we disconnect from our bodies also, because eating disorders create that disconnect between our, ourselves and our body, the more we disconnect from the people around us and therefore disconnect from our culture as a whole too, by the way. So another thing to think about is with how important food is in our culture, rejecting food from family members can, seen, can be seen as disrespect, right? So um, I'm thinking about several instances in which maybe our clients are trying to work on respecting their hunger and fullness cues and you have family members all of a sudden saying all these things to you, which can be um, kind of overwhelming and you try your very best to not be uh, irrespetuoso. <laughs> Um, and another thing to kind of keep in mind is like, um, for some, an attempt to change their body can be considered disrespectful towards their ancestors too. Um, and thinking about Marianismo and Machismo, we have like the belief that a woman's responsibility is to look beautiful for their husbands and the assumption that if their husbands end up leaving them or cheating on them, it must be the woman's fault too, because they didn't keep up some sort of like image. Um, and with men, the same thing. What does it mean to look macho, right? That, that also has an element in terms of like body image. Um, so now, and I wanna make, and I wanna make sure I emphasize this. I'm not saying that the, any of these beliefs are, or values are good or bad, um, but it is important for you to address and what way does it relate to what your client is experiencing through the, through the eating disorder and what healing could look like for them too. Okay. Okay. And so this is going to be a moment, I think it's going to be an opportunity for me to see what people are answering, but also time for self reflection. And again, these questions are something that I want you to, I want to invite you to think about for yourself, because these are things that could come into the counseling room or your appointment with, with your clients. Um, but these are also questions and ways that you can assess for what may be going on. Um, with your clients in terms of their own relationship with their bodies and with food. So one of the question is, what did you, uh, what did your relationship with your body look like growing up, right? So this is a question that you could ask your clients. I know that someone earlier had asked like, how do you find out? How do you learn more about that? Um, and I think that this is a valid question. This is a way that, this is a very open-ended question. Anything could, I, I, I love open-ended questions. This is why sometimes I don't necessarily hyper-focus on the assessments themselves because I think assessments can miss a lot of different things. Um, so I think this, it opens up the conversation for a lot more to come out. Uh, in what ways has your culture influenced this in your life? Again, how do we make sure we broach topics such as like our culture? How do we broach the topic of race too, which I'll talk more about later on. Um, let me see. I'm not sure, Juan, if you have any of the comments that you wanted to read. Yeah, I think uh, folks, uh, several questions I think have come up. I'm trying to summarize and appreciate everyone's engagement. And uh, I apologize if I'm not getting to everyone's. We'll hopefully have some time at the end um, where you can unmute and bring your questions back up. Um, but folks, I guess, are asking questions about like, how do you make an assessment for these things and differentiate between like bad habits um, or things that are culturally driven and something that's gotten to the point where it's a disorder and something that needs treatment. Like at which point do we, how do we draw the line? Can you draw a line? I think is kind of the general question I'm getting. I don't think there's a way to draw the line. There's so much nuance when it comes to this type of language. The first word that stood out to me was bad. Uh, and, and I think it's an invitation for people to assess, okay, if my client does come in and they're like, well, how do I get rid of these bad coping mechanisms, bad behaviors? I would wanna expand on what is bad. I would wanna explore more of that nuance and grayness of what it means to be engaging in these behaviors because I'll be talking about it later, but um, coping mechanisms are coping mechanisms. Um, whether they're good or bad, that's a whole other conversation and we can very much fall into that binary type of thinking. Um, but I think that this is an ongoing conversation. There's always, always more to learn. So unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a black or white answer. That, that's probably a theme that you're going to notice, by the way, which is why we explore so much of this in session with clients too. Thank you. I guess, yeah, I guess that's a, a question. Like, I think for me and something that I talk to clients is like, I don't really 
care like what the label or diagnosis you have is i always try to focus on like is this impeding your ability to live life the way you want to yep mm -hmm. but and i wonder if you can can that lens be applied to eating disorders absolutely absolutely um like i would want to know in what way is it impacting their everyday life right so if we think about these um values so if collectivism is something that's really important in our, within our culture and familismo the value of family is important in what ways is it isolating you this type of behavior in what ways is it isolating you from your loved ones um and i'll give some more concrete examples later on too but i think that's a very great way to put it like in, like take it a little bit further than the good or bad type of behaviors and what way is it impacting your your everyday life and what ways are you experiencing shame and guilt every day because that's not that's not healthy then um i'm looking at time and my brain is like freaking out <laughs> so i Don't might <laughs> i might like i might take a little bit longer to take questions or i might come back to them at the end yeah that's fine we can but just say notice the end. that's my thing my brain falls into these spaces of like i could go on with just one of these slides for a whole hour and a half um so let's look at some of the risk factors for eating disorders in the Latinx community. And by the way, I am I'm I'm reading um, the comments. I will be reading the, the chat messages. I think that I, I love seeing people's responses. Um, because I also I learn from everybody else. Everybody has, else has their own story and experiences, and everybody um, knows their body best. And and just I will be reading the chat, so I'm not ignoring them, by the way. Um, higher levels of acculturation, body dissatisfaction, and beauty image ideals financial insecurity and food insecurity, environmental influences, such as trauma, family dysfunction, family rigidity, socioeconomic status, documentation status, are all uh, significant risk factors for eating disorders and disordered eating in the Latinx community. So I'll be talking, focusing a little bit more on some of these and others, but it's something that I want you to um, be aware of. These are all things that could put your clients at high risk for developing eating disorders. Um, acculturation was the biggest one. Acculturation was one that I could find more studies on. And by the way, the sources are going to be at the end of the, of the slides. I'm sorry I didn't include it for all of them in here. Um, acculturation can be different from person to person. I think acculturation is more of a spectrum and, and it can change over time for people too. So acculturation is the process of cultural context and exchange through which a person or group comes to adopt certain values and practices of a culture that is not originally their own to a greater or lesser extent. And studies have shown that prevalence of eating disorder increases for each generation of Latinos in the United States with second generation Latinos having a higher prevalence of eating disorders than first generation and most likely due to the assimilation into white American culture. So we see that this preoccupation for being thin might be increasingly adopted in the Latinx communities um, that are integrated into the United States, like conceptions of beauty. And I want you to consider this. So research consistently shows that Latinx women are more likely to have larger body, curvier bodies, fatter bodies. Um, and by the way, I don't use terms of the BMI because I, it's been proven that it's not helpful in many ways. And it's not a helpful tool when discussing elements of health, by the way. Um, and so if like Latinx women are more likely to have larger bodies, and they face discontent with the appearance that they have. Um, they're more likely to engage in restrictive behaviors, which render them susceptible to developing eating disorder. Um, again, because we're constantly comparing ourselves to other folks' body. So many times I see adolescents trying to adjust to the United States. And so this kind of answers some of the questions about teens. Um, I see adolescents trying to adjust to the United States and believe that they have to give up a part of themselves in order to belong. So belong, we think about those core beliefs. And in and, and a personal note, I know I did. That's how I felt when I moved to the United States. It's a very common narrative. You give up your culture's music, you go to the extremes of, of bleaching your skin, which um, by the way, fat phobia has roots in um, racism and anti-blackness. Um, you bleach your hair, you reject your culture's food, your values, and you make your body shrink as much as you can, no matter what, no matter what the consequences are. Because I have a lot of my, a lot of my clients, like my clients are smart. They know what the consequences of all of this is. They know that there's a risk of death. And yet there's that, that, like that risk that they're willing to take. 
which speaks so much to the level to which it has an impact on them. When I arrived to the United States, I wanted to belong so bad. And back then I believed that belonging meant that I had to look like the people around me. Um, I could not take my, my, I couldn't make my accent go away overnight. I couldn't change my olive skin tone, but you know what I could do? I could try to shrink myself. And that's what I did. Only it took me 10 years to realize that I had an eating disorder myself. And no, and I had to figure that out on my own when I was in school and learned about eating disorders because none of my doctors, none of my therapists or family members noticed my symptoms. They only congratulated me for losing weight. So they, be aware of what you're congratulating when you're coming without even knowing. I've had clients that come into my office and tell me people were congratulating them for their weight loss and they had cancer. Or they had, or another one told me it took them years to realize they had diabetes. So be aware in what way are you reinforcing the message? This is a very common narrative and we continue to miss it. We continue to miss it as providers too. There's no excuse for us to miss, miss these symptoms. Take for example, the PHQ-9, which is the a screening tool for, for depression. One of the questions in there is, it talks about appetite. I don't like the wording in it. I can't remember what it is. I think my brain just like kicks it out. I think it's something about overeating or something like that, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to ask, what is your relationship with food look like? How's your appetite then? It can start with a question like that and it opens it up to so many more things. So let's talk about beauty image ideals in the Latinx culture. I grew up uh, with a lot of sayings and I would love to hear what sayings people uh, can remember from their own childhood. Uh, there are a lot of sayings around uh, beauty image ideals and especially for women. And so I wanted to include some of them and hence also the, the saying for the title of the webinar. Um, no hay mujer fea sino mala arreglada means there is no ugly women, only poorly groomed ones. But the word arreglada doesn't just mean groomed, it also means to fix, meaning I just need to be fixed in some way in order to appear acceptable in public, right? That's a very common saying that I grew up around. And I grew up saying that saying myself, not without even realizing what it meant. So when we think about those messages that we start to internalize, that's also what I mean, right? No hay mujer fea sino marido pobre, translates to there's no ugly men, only poor husbands. Right? which one addresses classism within our own culture, and two, not only referring to those that, um, it also refers to those that are able to afford plastic surgery, um, and it also refers to those that are able to afford, afford better clothing, get their hair done, their nails done, and even afford spas and buy nutritious foods. Um, beauty image ideals in the Latinx culture are very confusing. <laughs> Because you have, as Latinx women, we're expected to look exotic, sexual, have long, dark hair, accents, and have curves. But then, but they also want us to look Eurocentric. Blonde hair, blue eyes, pale skin, no accent. Be, like, present yourself as very smart, right? Whatever that means. Uh, and have a very, sl have very slim figure. So it's very confusing. And throughout acculturation, so this is one very clear example that I'm able to look back on. I came from watching and idealizing shows like Miss Columbia, Miss Universe in Columbia, to watching and desiring a thigh gap that I would see in Victoria's Secret uh, fashion show, right? Uh, so we go from one beauty ideal to next through acculturation too, right? There's still beauty, Im beauty image ideals in both of them. Um, and that's why as an adult this year, I was so ecstatic and happy to be able to watch, for example, Rihanna's fashion show. That was completely the opposite of what I, I grew up watching, right? And I think that there's always gonna be growth for more, but uh, if you don't know what that is, Google it, look it up. Uh, I'm sure there's videos on YouTube of it. And um, it was, it's just great, just a small comment there. Um, and so we do whatever we can to achieve these beauty Im image ideals, even plastic surgery, and that's not to say that plastic surgery is bad, but it's a reminder of the extremes that we go to be able to, for the sake of benefiting someone else's gaze. Right? Nowadays, it's very common for us Latinas getting ready. So another example that I think about is quinceañeras, right? Um, I know quinceañeras are not a big deal in all Latin American countries. I, where I grew up in Colombia, it was a very big deal. Um, and a very clear example that I have of how like it's sneaky 
body image and eating disorders and disordered eating, that culture as a whole is so sneaky. So we had, I went from seeing people wanting their quinceañeras to instead of getting a quinceañera, they wanted to money, the money to go through plastic surgery. And so that's one, it seems small to many, but it's, it's a big example and the ways in which we give up parts of our culture to be able to kind of get this other thing. Um, men also have to constantly deal with body image ideals, yeah, beauty image, beauty ideals, um, such as maintaining, again, that macho look, be masculine, be muscular, be confident, be tall, have hair, dominant and seductive, right? Uh, and yes, that means that also men are a risk of developing eating disorders. They also restrict, they overexercise, and even go again also to the extent of getting surgery to meet these societal expectations. Now, oh, I love the antes muerta que sencilla. Absolutely, absolutely promoting um, materialism, materialism. Um, now, this slide is very much binary. It's still very much binary thinking. Some of that is a reflection of all the research that I could find, unfortunately, specific to Latinx communities. Um, but there's just not enough research on men. There's definitely not enough or research in general on the LGBTQ population. And so um, I would love to be able to see people's um, thoughts on that. Some of it is erasure. Some of it is stigma. Some of it is the lack of safety still in Latin American country for folks um, in, from the LGBTQ communities to come forward and share their stories too, by the way. So lack of representation is part of the problem in the entertainment industry. This is within the United States, right? When you start having a conversation about body image ideals with your clients, lack of representation becomes part of the conversation. Um, and it's part of the problem, again. On this slide, I'm specifically talking about Hollywood. I'll talk more about Latinx folks in the next one, but I want to invite you to think about what social media says as well. So this is more about movies, music, all of that. But social media is a big deal right now. Um, when I asked people to tell, when I had, when I asked people before I put these slides together about like who are the famous Latinx people that they could think about, um, they always at first their question it always started with an um, very long pause trying to think who were the Latinx folks that they, they could come up with and and these were the people and I'm curious to see like very quickly um, what do people see on this slide like what are the things that stand out to you. And folks can feel free to unmute. It is yeah, feel free to a, unmute little, too. a little easier than yeah. tracking down a million chats. Success and glamour. Yes, money. <laughs> White Latinos. Yep, light skin, thin. Yep, curvy stereotype. Absolutely have hitting every single one of them. Uh, thin but curvy. Absolutely right. Yep. I'm um, with the male. I'm seeing tattoos uh, with Ricky Martin to uh, express that machoism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show those muscles. Show that like got like that macho aspect. I don't even know how to describe it, but you described it. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, yep, muscular. So. Um, Yep, we tend to see like even the people that think like off the top of their head when they can finally come up with an answer, they think about white Latinos. They think thinner and muscular, like the idea of like what fit looks like. Um, in the United States, we think about Latinx people. When in the United States, when I ask about Latinx people, they think about stereotypical Latinx men and women. These are the people, the, um, these, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at my other screen. These are the people that we're frequently comparing ourselves to in the industry. And guess what? The majority of us do not look like this. <laughs> Most importantly, genetics. Um, so how realistic is it for us to compare our bodies to a whole other human being that we're not even related to? Like, it, it's just, I laugh about it. I'm able to laugh about it now because it's like, it's surreal, the things that we do as humans when comparing ourselves to others. Also, there's not one black or indigenous person on this image. So imagine the added layer to what it means to compare yourself to these pictures. If these are the people that we compare ourselves to. Black and indigenous folks in Latin America continue to, in, to endure erasure in many ways and are frequently having to educate and almost prove to other people that yes, I'm Latinx too. Um, when it comes to body image, representation matters, visibility matters, 
And that means when the people I see on my phone or on TV do not sound like me or look like me, there's a core belief that's being instilled in our heads, such as I am not good enough. Notice how I say instilled too, because these are not beliefs that we're born with. These are things that we learn. And it takes a lot of unlearning too. Um, lack of representation, even within the Latinx and entertainment industry, there's uh, lots of anti-Blackness in our communities. And you can see it on this image too. Um, we still like see light-skinned people. We still see thin people. Those are the majority of people that we see on TV, right? And I chose Telemundo and Univision because it's um, the two channels that are seen the most here in the United States. Um, and it's the same as the, the path, like the other one, right? Who are we comparing ourselves to? And we grew up watching these telenovelas and believing the thin woman is the one that has the happy ending. The woman that has darker skin and is a bit chubbier is always the maid, the funny friend, the mean cousin, or the witch. Those are the things that we grow up comparing ourselves to. And even though it's like, it's always, it ends up, yeah, it always ends up being like the darker skinned person, um, the indigenous person that ends up having these roles. So what is it that we're learning? Even I was gonna say as children, but as adults too, right? Those are the, the images that we're comparing ourselves to. Um, I mean, like we, we take TV shows, like TV shows that I grew up watching. I don't know if these are, we're here too, but. Uh, we have Betty La Fea, which is Ugly Betty, but the original, original one, right, that's the one that I grew up watching. And we have another telenovela, which is Mi Gorda Bella, right, where the whole premise of these shows is that there's this woman deemed ugly, and all, the, all of a sudden, in some shape or form, make themselves pretty and thin for the male gaze. And only after that, that she, after she became pretty, she is now worthy of love and success and confidence. Those are the messages that are very deceiving that we are internalizing. Representation matters, visibility matters. And so it's important to see other sizes of bodies in the entertainment industry. Um, I see that they're trying to change this, but it's simply not enough. It's just, it's not enough. And change needs to happen, not just on TV, but also in the images we see every day. So I would encourage you to think about what types of magazines do you keep in your office? What types of pictures do you keep on your walls? Like these are the things that your clients also see. Um, take, it, take it a bit further for what TV and our phones may offer. It's also about what we are starting to offer um, from our, starting from our offices. So we have Celia Cruz, which I was arguing with someone on how that she was, was is our Beyonce. Um, some people like to argue otherwise with other folks and I'm okay with that. Uh, incredible singing talent, a black woman and a person of size. We have Juan Gabriel, who's an amazing singer but also a gay icon in Latin America. Nuestra belleza Latina, so when my mom was here, uh, we, it, I, <laughs> she, has, she had control over the TV so everything that she watched was what I was watching. And one of the things back then, I don't know if it's still on, was Mi belleza Latina, right? And it's this beauty pageant type of competition so fat phobic, so fat phobic. And at one point they switched things where they now allowed, allowed plus size women to participate. And I think that was the, the time when uh, trans women also was allowed to participate. Horrible, horrible TV show. Um, and we have Angela Ponce down here in the corner. Angela Ponce, who she was Miss Spain in 2018. Uh, was the first trans person to ever participate in Miss Universe. But the reason why I want to also highlight that is because again, 2018, 2018, before she was the first um, trans person that was able to participate um, Miss Universe. But even then we have to keep in mind that tra the trans community experiences incredible amount of pressure to live up to beauty standards too. And what it means to pass. Um, so that's something that I want you to sit with. All of these are elements that play a part in the relationship that we have with our bodies. And by the way, I'm not saying this. I, I feel it always feels like it's important to say this. It's not that I'm not saying that thin and white bodies are bad. It's that once again, when it's all you see every day, all the time, you start being sold this idea that your body's supposed to look like that. Sold, because there's a lot of money behind that idea, by the way. Three. So I'm looking at time. 
uh, social justice issues beyond food and weight talk. Um, we're we're going to be talking about marginalizations. I hate to do this because I want to hear what people have to say. Juan Gabriel is mejor del mundo. I love it. Um, what have you learned about health in your field? Focus on the word health. How would you define health? Name things that you look in a person's chart to determine their health. We've already kind of touched on this and some of the people already named some of this. Uh, I have a feeling you know what I'm going to be talking about. But we have to look beyond the number. We have to look beyond the number. And so again, these are questions that you can dive into with your clients when we think about that binary thinking. What is their concept of health? Because I get a lot of people that come in and they're like, but my health, right? especially when it's people that are like in larger bodies, right? And let me kind of clarify, there's nothing wrong with wanting to work on your health. The thing is that now we're starting to see that switch, right? Body positivity, body love. No, I love my body. I'm just worried about my health. But when we, when we dive into the, the whole definition of health, we come to realize it's, there's so much binary thinking happening. So again, health is not just in the numbers. I frequently see clients that de are deemed healthy because of the way they look. Because they're thin, fit, whatever that means. Um, and when their blood work comes back, when their EKG comes back, I am terrified and afraid for their lives. But they look healthy. I've also had clients whose bodies have been frequently shamed for looking unhealthy because they're fat or have a larger body. And they're some of the most physically healthy and fit people I've met inside and outside of therapy. These stereotypes that we hold on to. I've also met people whose blood work say that everything is fine, but engage in crippling disordered behaviors around food in their bodies. So again, we have to reassess. Mental health is also part of our health, right? So I think it brings it back to that question of, um, if you're telling me, and this kind of answers some of the questions that were being asked earlier, if you're telling me that all of a sudden you're isolating yourself from your family, your friends, your culture, because it's too overwhelming to look at a menu and eat a meal that you love, that's not health. If you're telling me that you can no longer engage in conversations with people because all you can think about is how um, how will you be able to make up for the breakfast you just had, the breakfast you just had, that's not health. If you're telling me that your day starts and ends with feeling guilty and shame uh, for giving yourself permission to feed your body or to rest, that's not health. So as practitioners, we know that those are, as practitioners and general counselors, doctors, dietitians, we know that factors such as stress, fear, and isolation um, can impact our overall health. So being bullied, discriminated against, and dehumanized because of the size of your body means that your physical health is also being impacted in some way. Once again, challenge the binary thinking of what healthy and unhealthy means. Uh, because unfortunately, we've taken this word and co-opted it in so many different ways. Health is complex, layered, and nuanced. So invite your clients to explain, expand their understanding of what health means in general and for them personally, because each one of them is going to have their own story. Um, it's important to ask questions such as like, does your definition of health include those with chronic illness? Because are those a set of unrealistic expectations that we're also setting for them? Because that's incredibly dangerous. Right? Um, does it include people whose body has felt like the enemy? for some reason, right? Such as like enduring chronic pain, such as like experiencing infertility and uh, loss. Does it, your definition of health include disability? Health is a complex lawyer, layered and nuanced word that it's important for us to dive in and not solely focus on that number on the scale or the BMI, whatever the BMI says, or even what the blood work says too. Um, health is also our mental health. We think about depression, anxiety, trauma, stress, fat phobia. We think about social support. Does your client have their family here? If we know that um, being an ex mean that we thrive in the collective, what does that look like? What does social support look like? Do they have a local church that they go to? 
right? If religion is important, religion and spirituality is important for them. Does their community support them? Does their president dehumanize them? That's part of our health too. That's also part of our body image. What do we see in the mirror and what's being said about us? It also means financial stability. Are we able to afford housing, food, other basic needs, right? As a counselor, we can give all of the breathing and grounding exercises. But if my client is hungry, if my client doesn't know where is it that they're gonna sleep that night, that's not health. Right? And it's all part of the eating disorder recovery too. Um, access to professional help. I'm sure this is a topic that's covered in every single webinar when it comes to Latinx communities. Accessibility is important. Can they afford it? Uh, does the DSIM-5 talk about them or is it just at the end of the book for like two pages, maybe one, maybe a paragraph, I think. Uh, are there any language barriers? I'm gonna have to skip this. I'm just gonna skim it actually. This is something that things that examples that I pulled from when I used to work at the clinic. So when I used to work at the clinic, um, it was for, I worked a lot with folks that were homeless, uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, people that weren't homeless, but couldn't drive, didn't have a car, like poverty line, like under the poverty line. If I only have $5 in my pocket and we're a family of five to feed, what should I buy until my next paycheck in two weeks? Is it a bag of organic kale from Earth Fair? Because we are now into this whole like health healthy eating thing, right? Where we kind of glorify what or eating organic means. People can't afford that. Like organic food is a lot more expensive, right? Are we thinking about if part of recovery is making sure that your client is being, is re receiving the nutrition that they need? Are you aware of what they can afford? Are they on food stamps? Do they have WIC, right? When we came into, when COVID started, the shelves were white, and all of a sudden my clients that had to wait until a certain day to get their money to buy food, by the time they got there, there wasn't any food. How do you think that interrupted the recovery from the eating disorder? If the, if what's at the top of the list is being able to make sure that they're eating consistently. And so even, and then I have clients where well, they, they should go to the local food pantry. Okay, we still have those $5 then. What are they gonna do? Are they gonna use it for gas? to drive to the food pantry? Are they gonna use it for the electric bill that has been passed due? Are they gonna buy period pads for their children? Are they gonna buy toilet paper with that, right? So it's that's why social justice issues are so incredibly important to address because they're all part of the recovery too, right? We have food and financial insecurity. It's important when thinking about Latinx folks, it's important to address, okay, where are they, where have, what's their story from then versus now? Consider the living conditions and stability of their home country. Um, changes in eating patterns when immigrating to the United States. Things change. You know how much I miss my food from Colombia? That had an impact on my appetite. That had an impact on binge eating behaviors in some way, right? Because my body, not only, um, yeah, my body is seeking for that thing and now I don't have that satisfaction piece. Right? Um, and let me say this, restriction, is not always just about food. Restriction also happens in the ways that you restrict parts of yourself. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind. Work schedule changes, um, access to food. Again, food deserts, ability to drive, affordability, food stamps, um, unemployment or income. Those are topics that are important to address with your clients. When we have clients that are struggling with this and these are things that they don't have any control over they focus on the things that they do. And sometimes our body are that thing. So be aware of how that has an impact on, on food. Los pobres niños en Africa aguantando hambre y usted botando la comida. So these were sayings that I remember hearing very often when I was a kid, right? I don't even know, at that age, I had no idea where Africa was, right? But from a young age, you're terrified. Um, oh, by the way, for, for those that don't speak Spanish, so. Yeah, I was um, gonna just, say. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> The poor kids in Africa uh, starving and you're throwing away your food. That's what I grew up hearing, right? So like the whole like clean your plate thing, because you just never know when is it that you're not going to have access to food, right? And so you're, you're taught from a very engaged to almost engage in these um, like shutting down your fullness cues for the sake of you just don't know, you never know, right? So there's that fear that's being instilled around food. Um, agua molida y viento raspado. 
And this one, it, it translates to ground, when people would ask, what are you going to eat today? And you would answer, agua molida viento raspado, which translates to ground water and scraped off wind. Right? And it's saying it refers to not having anything to eat. Right? So it speaks to, again, the element of poverty in the ways that it impacts um, a relationship with food. So again, go beyond the food and weight talk. With bulimia and binge eating disorder being the most common eating disorders among Latinx, providers will commonly prescribe diets and weight loss treatment. This makes us completely dismiss the real reason for the behavior and can sometimes reinforce it. Whether restriction is coming from a place of scarcity due to financial insecurity or from dieting, it's still a restriction and can lead up to binge. I want you to remember that too. This is why I am always, always aware of who I'm referring to. Because I want to make sure that if my client is struggling, I, I wouldn't recommend diets to anybody, but if my client is struggling with eating disorders, I want to make sure that my client's not being recommended something that's going to make it worse. Another self-reflection, probably don't have time at this point, <laughs> but I want you to kind of have it so you can kind of keep it in mind for yourself and for your clients as well. What did your own relationship with food look like? Did your ethnicity, culture, or family values have an impact on this? So the rule of food and the role of food in, in Latinx culture is food is not just food. Right? Food is not just fuel for us. Food is abundance, hospitality, comfort, traditions, affordability, and emotion. Right? Las penas con el, con el pan duelen menos translates to the sorrows with bread hurt less. Right? And, and so it, it speaks to how the ways in which we engage with food and to, with such a such an emotion. And yep, food is emotional and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we're constantly talking about emotional eating and how that's a negative, bad coping mechanism. No, food, food is emotional. And I mean this in different ways, right? Food is memories, it's love and it's care for us too. Yes, food can be used as a coping mechanism. And I don't think that this means it's a bad thing. When it becomes the only coping mechanism, that's when it becomes a disorder for many people. These are all pictures that I took when I was in my home country, Colombia. I love their food. I hold immense pride in it. And when I ask people, like I, I did this presentation a couple of years ago with some of these pictures. Um, and when I asked people before the presentation, what did they saw? What did they see? Oh, panza llena corazón contento, yes. Um, I had people that told me they saw big portions, too many carbs, lots of greens, fried foods, too many meats. But uh, what I see is the fish that my aunt cooks me every single year for my birthday. Because she knows I love it. I see my grandmother's early morning breakfast. I see two versions of a traditional dish in Colombia. I see memories of what it tastes like to be home. And I see the privilege of what it means to have a meal on my table too. I also see that I acknowledge the food that my food came from hardworking hands. These are also pictures that I took in Colombia. I see my childhood um, and my mom cooking with whatever she could afford that day. And I see my grandmother cooking in her yard because it tastes better that way. Uh, I see my little, and I see my little one. That's my little one. She was like, she was one there. Uh, I see my little one absorbing our beautiful culture one bite at a time. That's beautiful to me. That is emotional. And so when you live in a country, we bring it back to the United States, right? We think about acculturation. Um, when you live in a country that does not feel, look or sound or taste like home and all you wanna do is belong, sometimes you consider giving up these parts of yourself to stop feeling like the other. Um, imagine giving up these parts of yourself. What am I left with? A loss of identity, disconnection, from food, from my body, and therefore disconnected from the collective as a whole as well. Las penas con el pan todavía duelen. So the sorrows with bread still hurt, by the way. <laughs> um, and I put under there, and this put, y después la persona que te dio el pan te critica por estar comiendo, right? Because we still have diet culture elements in our Latinx culture. So the translation of the bottom one is like, um, and then the person that gave you the bread criticized you for eating, right? We have a lot of fat phobia and I have a video at the end that I hope people can just access because I don't think we're going to have time for it, but it very much talks about those mixed messages that we received kind of growing up too.
We can put the link in the chat for folks, Melissa. Oh, great, thank you. And eating disorders, everything is connected. I know this probably sounds repetitive at this point, not being thin enough, not healthy enough, not fit enough, not attractive enough, not disciplined enough, not friendly enough, not white enough, not smart enough, not wealthy enough, not fluent enough, not good enough, not just simply not enough. When you ask your clients to just stop eating X, right? Because we're thinking about the most commonly diagnosis for Latinx folks. Have you considered what you're asking them to give up? What part of their culture are you taking away? What resources are you taking away? Because if, if it is a coping mechanism, are you putting any other coping mechanisms in place or are you just taking away the only one that they have? Lots of barriers for people accessing um, care when it comes to eating disorders. Again, I think these are um, things that we co we're commonly addressing, such as like overall mental health stigma and this idea, la ropa sucia se lava en casa. The translation of that is like, uh, the dirty clothes is washed at home as to say like, we don't share any of our stuff with other outsiders, right? Therapists, providers are outsiders until you join that collective. Right? Lack of research, documentation status, um, accessibility, such as lack of insurance, um, language barrier, not being culturally sensitive, not having culturally sensitive treatment models and providers unchecked biases and privilege. Um, eating disorder recovery is expensive because it requires more than some other ones, right? Um, in order for us to go through eating disorder treatment, you're usually working not only with a, di th a therapist, you're working with a dietitian, you're working with your primary care physician, um, and sometimes we add, we have to add the psychiatrist, right? Because if there's something that requires medicine, we have to have that extra person. This is expensive, right? So a lot of people don't have access to it. Um, up until last year, I had reached out to three different local facilities. None of them had Spanish speakers, uh, Spanish speaking providers. Where am I supposed to send my Spanish speakers? Right? If they needed a higher level of care. Many of my clients that are Spanish speakers and needed a higher level of care, we couldn't, we couldn't send them anywhere. And we had to kind of keep going with what they could. That meant that the recovery was probably gonna take longer. Um, and so that's something to kind of sit with. It's crucial to address cultural considerations, which we talked about today. And it's very important to, once again, address things such as hunger and food insecurity, racism, colorism, and anti-Blackness um or anti-blackness ageism sexuality and gender these are all things that are part of who we are this is all part of our body these are all topics that we have to address and they're all like when we think about diet culture fat phobia these are all things that are at the root of all of them i'm not going to have enough time to talk about health at every size but there's plenty of plenty of research uh, information place to go i would say size diversity and health.org um there's a lot of misinformation and myths about health at every size. And it's very important. Thank you so much, uh, Juan. Uh, it's so important that you do like your actual research. Uh, health at every size talks about weight inclusivity, health enhancements and ways that you can do it while it still addresses social justice issues. Respectful care, no matter what the scale says, by the way, because whether you live in a fat body or in a thin body, you deserve respectful and care that you can access life enhancing movement and eating for well-being. Then we have intuitive eating. That could be a whole other presentation. Intuitive eating is one of those that um, can be complex because I don't think everybody's in the space to do intuitive eating, especially if you're recovering from an eating disorder. Um, so be mindful of that. And if, so for example, with eating disorder recovery, sometimes some folks, the initial part of recovery may be very mechanical eating, scheduling meals, um, eat, and people might not have hunger or fullness cues, by the way. And so in, intuitive eating, I love it. And not everybody can start with that. But what we can do is we can start addressing, okay, what does challenging the food police look like? So for example, stop equating the worth of good or bad, right? How do we start kind of like um, adding flexibility so that to that rigid thinking? How can we, okay, we're not in a love, body love, body uh, positivity space. But how can we start adding respect? Okay, in order for my heart to start healing, I need to start feeding my body and resting until it's stronger, right? That's still part of um, honoring health and respect to your body. So those are things to consider. 
Healing starts in the therapy room for many people. So respect for autonomy and compassion are great interventions when, person, when the person sitting across from you is experiencing shame and guilt about their bodies and the relationships they have with food, right? Exposure and visibility. I'm frequently talking to my clients about what is it that you're surrounded with? Who is it that you're comparing yourself to? Who is it that you're comparing your food and your body to? Reconnect with the body. I think it's important to consider safety and body dysmorphia in many ways when trying to reconnect. Communicate with the eating disorder. There's a purpose to the eating disorder. Eating disorders are a symptom of something else. It's important to address what, what is that. Validate, 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 grounding, grounding, grounding. <laughs> and then some parting recommendations. Um, consider who your business caters to and if you can make it more accessible. Okay? So be aware of your chairs. The chairs in your office, do they harm, have arms? Like if, if a client that had a large body that was fat, would they fit on your chairs, right? Are your chairs strong enough, right? That's a message that you're getting across. Are you welcomed here? Is your body welcomed here? Are you, is it okay for you to show up in your most authentic and vulnerable self? Um, wide enough bathrooms, insurance, sliding scales, Visibility and representation matters. Again, be aware of um, your staff, right? Art, books, magazines, to toys, websites, resources. Right? If you're a plate therapist, are all, the toys that you have, are, all, are they only white and thin? That's something to consider, right? Because what are your children seeing? Are they seeing themselves in the toys that you have in the room? What about the paintings in your office? Right? Are they all white and thin too? Uh, what about your website? Right? What does your picture look like? Right? Did you use Photoshop for your own picture? Right? Did, does your picture look very well put together? Right? Zoom has a beauty option. Do you find yourself having to do that right before you jump into session with your clients? Those are all, th this is not necessarily like saying it's a bad thing. It's something to sit with. Like, what does that mean for me? When am I doing that so automatically without even realizing that I'm doing that? Language matters, so be aware, remain aware of your own use of rigid, binary thinking type of words, so healthy, unhealthy, good, bad. Um, know, please know who you're referring to. Uh, if I have a binge eating, uh, if I have a client that's struggling with binge eating, I'm not gonna refer them to someone that's gonna put them on a diet. That's dangerous, that's harmful. Um, normalize fat bodies. Don't add to the shame and that your fat clients are already experiencing outside of your office. Explore ways in which clients have disconnected from their cultural identity because of the eating disorders. And acknowledge the ways in which your own privileges, biases might be affecting your clients and patients. So make sure you're addressing your own internalized fat phobia. Um, there's, these are some resources and with this I'm done um, that I want you to make sure you have access to. Body Respect is um, the book that speaks more on health at every size. Intuitive Eating, of course, and they came out with the most recent uh, version this year. Treating Black Women with Eating Disorders. I think it's an incredibly important book for people to be reading right now if you're interested in working on eating disorders and if you're not too. Uh, Sick Enough is specifically about eating disorders and it kind of goes into detail uh, with each one of them. Binge eating disorder, the journey to recovery addresses trauma too. Unfortunately, the, all these top ones are not, well, and fearing the black body, by the way, is an incredibly important book for everybody to be reading. Eating disorders or not, it speaks on how uh, fat phobia is rooted in racism and the history of it. Um, and so then we have websites such as like Size Diversity and Health, Mangona Positivity Pride, Mindful Eating Mexico has great, great, great resources in Spanish. Um, and then Latinx Health Collective is a course that a, a dear friend of mine, Carolina Guisar, who's a dietitian, created. We created a course for Latinx folks on intuitive eating and body image healing, specifically again for in, in thinking about cultural considerations. And that's the video, but you'll be able to watch it. It's really cheap. Um, and that's it. Did I make it? One minute to spare? 1129 amazing yes. well done melissa um no but thank you so much melissa um and thank you all for the comments and for engaging uh, i think that the chat was often clairvoyant they were saying things in there and then you would present on them it was kind of funny like the the quinceanera and plastic surgery thing mm -hmm. uh, and several others 
Um, so thank you all so much. Melissa, if I can have you unshare, and Melissa, I don't know if you have to run to something else, um, but I know that maybe some folks, if we could stick around, maybe some folks can ask a few final questions. Um, yeah. are, you, are you able to stay for a little bit? I'm able to stay. Okay, so yeah, if folks have the time, we'd love for you to, to stay and, and voice some questions. Um, but we'll just do some wrap up real quick. Let me pull up my presentation. So again, a reminder, if you liked what you saw today, uh, you can join us uh, on the network at La Mesita. It's la dash, if I can type it in, mesita.mn.co. Um, it's a provider network that we've created and that's where we keep folks up to date uh, on everything that we're doing in La Mesita. Uh, but also it's a great place to connect and um, to reduce isolation from providers around the uh, state doing this work with Latinx folks. Um, so if you join, you might see an announcement about our next webinar. Again, uh, mark your calendars for January 22nd um, from 10 to 11.30. So they're typically on every fourth Friday uh, or the fourth Friday of each month uh, at this time. We have a COVID survey that we're hoping to get your help on. This is just giving us an idea of what COVID impacts on the Latinx community have been looking like across the state and it's something that we're using to report to funding uh, and state resources to be able to um, inform how they help us intervene on behalf of the Latinx community. So it takes about five minutes. We'd really appreciate it if you can take a second to fill that out. Um, again, like I mentioned, there is our La Mesita um, link. So please join us. You just create a bio real quick and put a picture on there say a little bit about yourself and then you're plugged into, I think we have almost close to 900, maybe we're over 900 providers across the state who are a part of our network. Um, so we're growing. Um, so yeah, thank you once again, Melissa, for the folks that are still here, if you can turn on your video and maybe do a Zoom clap uh, for Melissa uh, for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you. And We'll open it up to questions if folks want to unmute. Um, if we can do unmute, that I'd prefer that so I don't have to be reading through the chats. And La Mesita is, uh, if you can join in from out of state, it's perfectly okay. Uh, but it is typically geared towards responding to Latinx, uh, Latinx community in North Carolina's issues. But again, those things apply across the, the country usually. So yeah, any questions for Melissa? Um, on anything that was presented today. Hello, um, can I ask, uh, it's a comment and a question maybe. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Cynthia Aguilar and actually I would say that in my other life, I used to be a psychologist because I'm, I'm from Costa Rica. So back then I, I was a psychologist uh, and I am still I am. But anyhow, any, in any case, I'm working now with NC State University and I do a uh, programming for Latinos. And I really don't do much on nutrition issues, but I used to be involved with the SNAP Ed programs and FNET programs. I don't know if you are familiar. So I wonder if you know there is a chance to work with people providing those type of trainings. You know, so I know, you know, your presentation is a lot uh, within the, the clinical setting, uh, but I think education can be, can be brought to other areas. So again, I, any, any efforts or initiatives in making that collaboration to bring it just at the basic education level? I, I agree. I think that that could be incredibly powerful for it to happen. And I am I'm gonna say this and being mindful about the, the amazing resource that it is. And what I've also observed is um, there, for some folks, there has been the educational piece and unfortunately their experience has been very binary type of thinking, such as like, you should only eat these types of foods or like, or kind of like the, the assumption that only these foods are healthy for you. Right? And so, or at least food stamps, it's a little bit different because you go through a different type of application versus WIC. Uh, where with there is sometimes an educational aspect, or at least there is for this county, right? That has been my experience with some of my clients. And so I do believe that that could be incredibly, that could be so powerful and so helpful in so many ways. And I think that there has to be an acknowledgement that there's uh, room for growth to happen right now 
even within that that space too. When and I mean that by addressing fat phobia so directly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Sandra Rivera, did you want me to unmute? Okay. Um, we have a question here, uh, and this is, uh, I think, a really great question from uh, Diana Mena. How do you help people navigating mixed messages from family? One minute, estás gorda, or you're, you're fat. The other minute, you're uh, flaca. Um, both can be said as an insult or praise. Ooh, this is, in therapy, we process that a lot, and we kind of explore, okay, where is that historically coming from? What's their own fat, like internalized fat phobia? We talk about what is theirs and what is yours and how can you make sure you're not holding that for them, right? Um, there, there, I think there's a lot of projections that happen within the family. The ways that they feel about their own body um, can be projected onto others. And I think it's that. I think there's many, you would know your, fat, like, I'm not saying you, but like, in, it's a little bit more complicated because of like the respect aspect of our culture. And so sometimes we kind of practice in session, like, okay, how would a conversation with this family look like, family member look like? Uh, what would you want them to know? What do you have the capacity to do? Because I think sometimes there's an acknowledgement of, is this person even open to having a conversation with me? Or are they just kind of dropping something and then walking, kind of walking away? I think there's many elements to kind of keep in mind. What I come back to is how can you make sure you ground yourself in what you know about yourself so that you're not holding whatever it is that they're projecting onto you. Melissa, I have a question. Um, I work a lot with the Latino women and youth and the, the way of identity and managing and navigating both and for example, uh, we use gordita, flaquita as, um, uh, how do you say, cariñoso, as a very kind way to refer to our family members. But for example, even my grandchildren, they say, how you are so mean to, to grandpa calling him gordito <laughs> because they are half bilingual. Um, so, but I see that in youth, how challenging it can be that uh, navigating, you know, the expectation of language in English, but also keeping, especially on accompanied minors, that they keep having, you know, the nicknames, uh, Pelon, um, I don't know, well, everything referring to the appearance. Yeah. So, yeah, any, any recommendations or links or something to read and be able to talk with them about how to navigate in those two realities. I think that again, when we take all of these cultural values, it, it's complex. And at the same time, I think it depends on the person, right? And, and for whatever reason, it's making me think about a cultural rate of stress too. Uh, the ways in like across like generations, there's these things that don't necessarily match, but we wanna be able to respect them both either way. Um, for the younger folks, like there is sometimes that conversations that happens with the family as a whole, if there's an opportunity to do that in the, in the, in the room, um, addressing why that is impacting the, the team, for example, right? Why it bothers them, why it's affecting them. And I hear that from adults too, to be very honest, where now as adults, they're finally sitting with, actually, I never liked that they would call me gordita. Right? <laughs> I never liked that. And it's not even the word in it of itself. It's what it implies. Mm -hmm. it's the 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 it's what it implies it's also the fact of not being respectful of what I'm asking you to do don't call me that name mm -hmm. don't call me that name right it's not so I think it taps into respect and 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 um in many ways I think it addresses a cultural a culturative stress as a whole I think there's always there's always that opportunity for communication to happen and for you to kind of moderate that conversation and session. And, and I also come back to, um, there's room for so much because you can address it with the parents and kind of exploring what is it, what are the types of messages that they've internalized. Mm -hmm. um, and while also addressing, I've had teen clients that are totally okay with the term and it's not my job to tell them, oh no, but it's not okay, right? So I mm -hmm. think it is, uh, it's a, also a very nuanced conversation and that it depends on the person and what their personal needs may be and where can we go from there to get those needs met too. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you add to the mix that the teacher, um, quite, you know, Anglo teacher that reacts in, you know, total panic, sorry, about how they can call it because they understand enough Spanish, especially ESL teachers, and they just overreact because somebody calls another one. Mm -hmm. Like or Pelon or whatever. Thank you. I appreciate your, your Thank guidance. You, Thank you, Norma. Uh, Nancy, I see you've unmuted. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't, I, I just want to thank you. I do work with young um, Latina girls and not eating is, is a big problem for them. And if you could point me to any information for that, um, I would appreciate it. Um, and for, I would say that some of the websites that I put on the slides could be a great place to start. NEDA, uh, N-E-D-A, um, has some great resources on, um, on like ways that you can kind of start that conversation. Um, I think that it's also, I come back to what is that a symptom of? Yeah. Because the eating disorder is offering them something. There's, there's, it's serving a purpose. Yeah, you had given me a lot of pointers to, to yeah. do better. I keep yeah. coming back to that, like trying to, un one, addressing like safetyness, right? Like, uh, is there malnutrition that's happening? And do, do we need to make sure we address it with the doctors? Because there's so many different things that can happen in a teen's body yeah. when they're not feeding it. That's um, right. Very dangerous things. And, and like, um, how do you say atrasando? Their right. development, uh, or their uh, impact their development and growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's one of those things that I would assess how severe is the restriction? How long has it been going on? And after you kind of assess for safety and all of that, um, we can also dive into, as you do that too, you can start diving in, okay, where is that coming from? And sometimes they know, sometimes they're not able to know, and that's okay. And that's why we kind of um, make space to kind of dive into the nuance of what it means to to be struggling with an eating disorder too. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Any other comments before we wrap up for today? Connie, did I see you wanting to make a comment? I think you're muted, Connie. Sophia, could you help them mute? Okay, looks like we're having some trouble. I just said thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thank All right. Well, I think we'll we'll write we'll wrap it up there uh thank you again melissa for such a wonderful uh, important and thoughtful uh presentation on such an important topic um i think you can see from the activity on the chat and the discussions we had people really appreciated um having your expertise um and i think your vulnerability too you know i think this we, we really appreciated we always say our our uh, presentations are interactive but i think folks can really really had a chance to connect with you today by your presentation style. So really I'm appreciate glad. it. I'm glad. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much everybody for um, being so engaged too. I love some of the sayings that some people included here. Um, and I, I noticed that some people were already answering some of that, like what's available in North Carolina in terms of high level of care. So thank you for that too. Yeah, so again, if you like what you saw today and you're not a member, please join us on La Mesita. Um, we have these webinars every month um, and we have lots of other programming. You can also check that out at um, lfuturo-nc.org uh, and click under the um, menu item for La Mesita. Um, so please join us. Um, thank you, Sophia. So thanks, Melissa. Um, and we will see you all at the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.